So I'm going live now. Uh, just give me three, 30 seconds. Okay. <clears throat> I'm going live now. Okay. Good afternoon, um, ladies and gentlemen. Okay. My name is uh, Rafaela Irie. I'm the manager data and statistics at AFRA. Um, this afternoon, we are going through um, an executive session that will be uh, moderated by one of uh, the, the most skillful um, aviation professional. Uh, her name is Adefunke Adeyemi. She's um, the Regional Director Advocacy Strategic Relations for Africa at IATA. Adefunke is a lawyer, advocate, and global aviation expert focused on bringing value, policy reform, best practices, and international standards to aviation sector. She holds a Master of Law from the prestigious University of Cambridge, United Kingdom, and a Master of Business Administration from Nyang Business School, Singapore. Um, uh, in her current role in IATA, Adefunke advocates for the susta sustainability and growth of the aviation industry across the region. I like to it's a value to economies and societies as a strategic enabler and catalyst for development, growth, and force for social goods. Adefunke is uh, the IATA focal point for the implementation of the single African air transport markets. And today she's going to give us a presentation on the SATAM, uh, uh, the SATAM um, study that were conducted by IATA for the African Union Commission. So, um, Funke, I will give you the floor so that you can start your presentation just now. Thank you very much, Rafaela, and good afternoon to participants. I think we have four participants on the call. If what I'm seeing is correct. So I can uh, maybe share my screen. Perhaps you can let me know if there are people for me to begin the presentation. Do we have enough? Yes, we can start. In fact, we have, uh, we have 50, 52 persons actually connected. Ah, okay, great. Yeah. All right, so good do. afternoon, everyone. And uh, thanks again to uh, Afra for the opportunity to present uh, on, on this very important topic. So just without further ado, I'm going to go straight into the presentation. Um, before I do that, I'd like to remind us of what our Director General and CEO, Mr. Willie Walsh, uh, said in his remarks to us this morning at the opening ceremony of the AFRA AGM. He said, connectivity is precious and everyone, not just the rich, not just the elite, benefits from it. He also said that connectivity is going to be essential towards ensuring meaningful recovery for both the aviation industry and for economies around the world. That really makes a lot of impact for us here in Africa. And you therefore agree with me that improving intra-African air connectivity is going to be vital to the recovery and the sustainability of African economies and our beloved industry. Before I start the presentation, I would like to take a poll right now and ask a, a few questions. Before the COVID pandemic hit, how, um, how many or how much intra-African traffic do we think um, was happening by fifth freedom uh, market access across Africa? How much of that, what percentage of intra-African traffic was being conducted or being operated or was reflected uh, through fifth freedom market access, which is what the Yamasuko decision and the single African air transport market are promoting. 
So Rafaela, I don't know if we're ready to take the poll question. Um, we can do that right now. Okay, no problem. Let me just launch the poll. Um, dear attendees, you can just, um, you will see the poll prompted, kindly respond and uh, we give uh, 30 seconds to, to, to receive the questions. Okay. So we are receiving some, some, some feedback. Okay. So I can't see the poll, but uh, so perhaps you can share the answers with me once the poll close, closes. Yeah. Thank you. We are giving some few seconds and then... Uh, Okay, still receiving some questions. We'll uh, close That's the poll fine. in, in uh, 15 seconds. Okay. So this is a, an interesting way uh, for us to take the pulse of what people think and feel about um, intra-African uh, connectivity, as well as intra-African air service liberalization. It's also an, an important way for us to be able to showcase um, some of the out, outcomes of the study that we did, uh, some of the revelations that came out of the study as well. So do we have the results now? Um, yes, okay. So, okay. so far, 46% uh, of the respondents said that 10% um, of the intra-African traffic is operated on fifth freedom basis. Uh, 30 22% uh, thinks that 20% of uh, the intra-African traffic is operated uh, on fifth freedom. 7% uh, voted for 30% of intra-African traffic uh, operated on fifth freedom. And 14% said that 40% um, of intra-African traffic is operated on fifth freedom. Excellent. Thank you very much. And these are very interesting and revealing answers. And I'm going to give you the answer very soon in the course of the presentation. So let's go straight into it. We conducted a study um, which was expanding on the study we did in, 2012, in 2014, if you remember the 12 country study, which would became quite a, a famous study because it was the first of its kind looking at the economic benefits of aviation across Africa. If key markets were to liberalize their air services. Um, the African Union commissioned IATA um, in collaboration with InterVistas and a communications company called Simplicity to expand that study to the 55 countries on the continent. And the results of the study are what I'm going to be sharing with you today in, in some key highlights. Um, we're going to look at it from the point of view of one part, taking stock of where we were. So as at the point of the study, we looked at 2019 numbers and looked at a few parameters. We reviewed bilateral air service agreements to see their compliance with the key provisions of the Yamasuko decision. We reviewed um, the, the airline operations in terms of um, routes and frequencies, and we looked at several other parameters. And that study revealed several interesting things. And we'll look at that at the first part, looking at the taking stock, the second part, looking at the value and the benefit of a better liberalized Africa across all of the, the countries in Africa. And the fifth part, looking at the advocacy and the communications. So in the first part and looking at the state um, lens, we did a review of 607 bilateral air service agreements from the African states. And this was what we had access to directly from the states as, as well as through the portal under ICAO. Um, out of this analysis, we discovered that 39% of them were YD compliant, and I, and I will speak to what that means shortly, while 61% were non-compliant. The compliance um, with YD really focuses on articles two to six of the Yamasukro decision, which look primarily at market access, so the freedoms of the air and, and what access 
uh, countries have to that to that uh, uh, market, um, pricing, uh, frequency, capacity, and such other key elements. So this was looking at these bilateral air service agreements, their provisions, and seeing how compliant they were with these core articles two to six of the YD. And we discovered also that the most YD compliant countries are Cabo Verde, Mozambique, Mali, Senegal, and Cameroon. The countries with the fewest compliant bases are Uganda, Burundi, Libya, Seychelles, and Morocco. And the countries with the highest number of bases indicating their market size and their openness to do business with other African states are South Africa, Kenya, Ethiopia, Egypt, Rwanda, Morocco, and Nigeria. In addition to the, the BASA analysis, and you can see the entire table for all of the 54 countries on in the table on this on the screen. In addition to that, we also carried out extensive literature review and analysis you, and, the, and the use of an analysis, uh, an analysis and analytical framework, which uh, we was developed um, um, for the purpose of the study, uh, just before the study, but enhanced for the study called the uh, Satam Enablers Index, which looked at key parameters or enablers that capture key features of air transportation split into four broad classifications, including the country performance, so how is the country doing on GDP, uh, on market access, and so on, on safety and security, on infrastructure, and on aviation policies and regulations. So looking at all of these elements, literature review, service from countries and airlines, and the use of this analytical framework, um, two overarching themes emerged. The first is that there is uh, or appears to be in a culture of non-prioritization of aviation by African states. And the second is a policy or attitude of survival based on protectionism by both states and by airlines. So these obstacles and constraints to the full implementation of the YD and the SATAM um, were things that, we, that came out of this extensive research. We also discovered, in addition to some of those challenges, that based on the SATAM enablers index that we used, that there are currently 13 states across the 54, or 54 states in Africa with a fully favorable environment for the successful implementation of SATAM. So no impediment to SATAM, to going forward with SATAM implementation. The, the Enablers Index also showed us that another set of 12 states need improvement to optimize uh, the successful SATAM implementation, as some have com some constraints. And, and the final um, um, revelation was 10 states that need significant improvement to optimize their SATAM, mainly on the issue of achieving the 60% effective implementation, implementation of the ICAO standards and recommended practices on safety. Um, the analysis, of course, also provided for the 20 non-SATAM states. So of these 13, 12, and 10 that I've mentioned, these are of the SATAM states, the states that have currently signed up to SATAM, the, the 35 of them. Um, but it also looked at what is the picture for the additional 20. Then, we look at what are the common elements for the states that require improvement in their aviation environment. And we saw you know, a number of common themes uh, emerging. One of them being, um, one of them being the, the compliance level with the articles um, of, of the YD in terms of their BASAs, the low rate of compliance with the ICAO um, standards uh, score, low visa openness amongst them, so the ability of people to move freely, poor airport infrastructure, low levels of implementation of the SATAM con concrete measures, which are the administrative measures set up by AFCAC, the executing agency for states to comply with in order to proceed with um, YD and SATAM implementation. Now, having looked at all of this and done this extensive work in terms of looking at the where are we with states, we also come up with recommendations for each of the SATAM states to address 
whatever challenges they face or to enable them to move forward with implementation. The key recommendations that came out from this extensive piece of work is one, the need for all states in Africa to achieve the minimum 60% effective implementation score for ICAO SARPs. The second is all airlines with IOSA certification should be supported to maintain their good standing and those who are not on IOSA certification should be encouraged and supported to achieve IOSA certification. And we're doing some work with AFRA and ASCAC on this. The third is the states to urgently address the aviation infrastructure gaps on the, in the air and on the ground. And we heard some of these challenges, uh, uh, particularly as it relates to cargo from, from the previous panel, the CEO uh, session. For that there must be concerted efforts to bring down high taxes and charges uh, environment by state and because it's negatively impact the aviation industry and demand for travel because of the affordability of, of air tickets for, for travelers, the majority of Africans. The fifth is the certain states for those who have signed the solar commitment need to remove the requirement for approvals for foreign operations, specifications, inspections, and so many other things um, that our, our states are currently asking for, because that is not the spirit and the intent of the Yamasuko decision. A simple file and fly should be a fundamental aspect of the SATAM and should be happening right now. The legacy of protectionism needs to be addressed, which is where you know, the uh, airlines are prevented, other airlines are prevented from coming into a country to protect a state interest in an airline. And these are some of the issues that have pervaded over the years and are not helpful uh, towards the implementation of SATAM or even towards a healthy aviation environment and industry. The seventh is, is governments across Africa needing to prioritize aviation, making it a strategic um, element of their national development if their economies are to realize their full potential. And we've seen this happen across many countries in the world. And also um, institutionalizing the regulatory text. So the YD itself, the framework, and then the underpinning regulatory text, the consumer protection regulations, the competition regulations and the dispute resolution uh, regulations needing to be um, well uh, uh, communicated, and well uh, uh, passed along to the stakeholders uh, for a successful operation of SATAM, um, supporting all of the efforts of APCAC and the, as the functioning uh, executing agency. And also, and finally, um, having the states sign multilateral agreements, granting the free access or exercise of fifth freedom air traffic rights amongst the signatories and clearly abolishing the need for future buses between them or the states to continually bilaterally amend their buses to bring them in line with YD. Now, this B maybe may not be the way to move forward because that is the way that we have been coming. Um, but A, uh, 10A might be a more proactive uh, approach to adopt a multilateral framework to move forward with implementation of the SATA. So this is the state side. Now, when you look at the industry operation side, how is the industry contributing to um, operation of uh, air services? When we looked at an analysis of air services within Africa over a 10 year period from 2009 to 2019, we saw that you know, from 2009, there were 598 unique airport pairs, meaning city pairs, uh, routes between one city to another. And over that 10 year period, it increased from 36% to 137%. And we can see the picture, a bit more density in terms of the frequencies on those routes and just a few more routes, um, taking 598 to 800 and something routes. But again, not significant, not significant enough to really move the needle and move the numbers. So this is the picture as of 2019 before COVID hit. And when we look at the top markets, the country, the top five in terms of intra-regional, intra-African air connectivity, and the bottom five, we see again that there's been little movement. South Africa remaining number one uh, from 2009 to 2019 because of the, um, some of the challenges they've had. I'm sure that that number 
has dropped slightly, they'll probably be within the one, you know, first one to three. Um, and uh, some of the other top markets not really moving much, even though they're the most interconnected, because it's still operating, you know, the same routes, maybe with added frequencies on them. And then we see that those countries that don't really have as much intra-regional connectivity like Cabo Verde, as we, as we heard already, um, it's, it's crucial for them, um, maybe for, for many reasons. Some of these countries don't have their own national airline um, or access is just more difficult, maybe because of geographical location and so many other factors. And we can see again that the connectivity score will again did not, um, did not really uh, move too much in terms of the numbers, but the impact is quite significant for these small countries. So looking again now at this slide, and this is a very important slide that I'd like to highlight, and this takes us to our poll. This is the answer to the question on our poll. The question was, what percentage of um, intra-African routes do we believe are operated on the fixed freedom basis? And we got majority believing that it was 10%. The actual answer is looking at international passenger number flows within Africa in 2019, it was 14.4%, 14.4%. So about, let's say for 14.5, let's say 15%. So we're in between you know, the two largest um, responses, which was 10% and 20%. We're sitting right in the middle. So 15% of passengers flew across Africa on the basis of fifth freedom, while the majority, 84%, was taken direct, point to point. And a very small uh, percentage, um, um, 0 0.2 million passengers, 1.1%, having to connect outside of Africa. So again, let's remind ourselves of what fifth freedom means. It means an airline say Esky, for example, flies from its hub in Lome and flies to Lagos. It flies with passengers and cargo from Lome and flies to Lagos. From in Lagos, it drops off and picks up passengers and cargo and flies on from Lagos to a third country, say Liberia. And then it does the same thing on the way back. Now, what this does is that it provides that accessibility that we heard Sanjeev mention in the previous um, panel within Africa into the places that either don't have direct services or um, don't have airlines. So there is still a lot of room for fifth freedom, which is really the driver of liberalization. So today we have about 15% of passengers being taken across Africa on the basis of fifth freedom. This other slide also shows us a little bit more about what we're saying. And if we look at it based, broken down by region and we aggregate these percentages, we'll see that we come to more or less what we have seen just now and the answer to those questions. And again, a huge um, penetration of point to point traffic, particularly in the regions that have carriers Southeast, North Africa, but West and Central, where the, the in terms of carrier numbers, they're not that many, uh, but there is a need for access. You see more um, granting of fifth freedom rights. But the picture is still nowhere near where it should be in terms of that picture of liberalization on the basis of fifth freedom, which is what the Yamasuko decision is asking for. Um, interestingly as well, we discovered that even third and fourth freedom rights, the basic point to point, fly from city A to another and back, are also being restricted. And this was something that was quite a, a startling revelation from the, the analysis of the study and was not what we were expecting, um, that even third and fifth freedom rights are still being restricted across the continent. So this is in terms of airline utilization of those freedoms. And then when it comes to the, the level of cooperation amongst airlines, and we heard a lot about this in the previous panel, is that both on interlining and on code sharing, which are, are the two basic forms of cooperation, it is 
uh, uh, still very low across uh, African airlines. And that the portion of code sharing as an example, looking at 100 seats within different regions is here in, in the graph, but on average is two and a half seats for every 100 seats on the basis of a code share. And this partnership is so important and so, so important. And I was in, it was interesting actually to hear from uh, um, the previous, not just the previous presentation, but one of the analysis during the outlook of COVID to, to see uh, something, a startling figure that there are 131 new airline startups planned for Africa. And I was thinking, wow, you know, the ones that we have today were not cooperating enough. And now we want to start up another hundred and something, which will represent 20% of all startups. Nothing wrong with starting up, nothing wrong with entrepreneurial spirit, but how about cooperating and, and fostering a real spirit of cooperation? And that's one of the findings that came out of the study that while cooperation does exist, there is need for stronger cooperation and a wide scope for further coordination, especially uh, by smaller and medium-sized operators who simply don't have the bandwidth in terms of capacity, in terms of aircraft to be able to do uh, what they need to do uh, and, and to be able to operate on their own. And the other is that um, in terms of Interline cooperation agreements, it's two of the larger airlines with more extensive networks and, um, and international connections. They are each party to more than 15 of the interline cooperation agreements, which confirms the lack of extensive cooperation amongst African airlines. The majority of African airlines are using the meter framework and are party to five or fewer agreements compared to the, um, the world average of uh, about, I think African airlines have about eight um, interline agreements on average compared to the global average of about 65. Um, we talked about code sharing, which is quite low. Uh, and also we've seen the variations and approximately in terms of the, the number of uh, intra-African seat capacity that is offered, it's offered on the basis of 64% of African airlines operating independently, while 37% of inter-African seat capacity is offered by African alliance uh, airline members who are in alliances. Um, and again, this is interesting because that independence, you know, doing it all by oneself has not really helped us to generate the scale and the scope that we heard talked about, the volume that we heard talked about in the previous um, session. Um, there are many ways to cooperate, starting from the basics, as I mentioned, interlining code sharing, all the way up to um, you know, loyalty programs, uh, joint ventures, mergers and acquisitions, and so on. And there are different models that can help support moving the needle. So this is our stock taking. And finally, uh, we're gonna, this is our stock taking for where we were. So I, I want to pause uh, on that uh, and to see, Rafaela, if we have any questions. Uh, at this stage, if not, I'll just proceed with the second part of our study, which then looked at the value and the benefits of intra-African connectivity with full liberalization across all 55 states. Many of you have seen um, this picture before. Yes, go ahead. Yes, we have a question from yes. uh, Victoria. Um, of the 13 certain states with the favorable environment already implemented, or are these all states that have not yet implemented? This okay. is a question so, from Victoria. Yes, yes. So, so it's a combination um, of, of states. There are some of those 13 who are already implementing, implementing the SATA, meaning that they're operating fifth freedom rights and with compliant bases. Um, but not all 13 of them are at that level. And again, if you, if, uh, the, the focus for the first part is really looking at the compliance level of the agreements that are currently in place, the bilateral air service agreements between states to see how compliant they are with the SATAM. 
So within the 13 states, not all of them are implementing SATAM completely in terms of granting of, of um, free fifth freedom access, but they have the makings and the bones to be able to do so were they to liberalize um, their VASAs for those who have not done so yet. I hope that answers the question. So let okay, me we on. have another, uh, sorry, we have another question. We'll take just right. one from AWOS. Yes. Uh, yes. How will countries without an airline benefit from Saturn? Oh, wow. So I think they benefit the most, in fact, because the whole point about Saturn is provision of air services. So every country in Africa cannot have an airline. Um, if we look at other areas in the world, take Europe, um, take China, Asia, China, take Asia, Asia Pacific, and, and take Latin America. Not all of the countries in these regions and in these countries I've mentioned have dedicated airlines. What happens is that there are airlines who provide services. And Airways, I know you're from Nigeria, so let me give you an example. If you remember, there was a time that Arike in Nigeria was designated as flag carrier for, um, I think it was Sierra Leone, yes, yeah, Sierra Leone and Liberia. And Arik Air was providing the service, even though it was a Nigerian registered air, airline, it was providing the same sort of service for these countries who did not have any airlines of their own. So that is what the SATAM is meant to be able to do, for Arik Air to be able to operate out of its hub in Lagos and carry passengers on fifth freedom basis from Lagos to Sierra Leone um, and Liberia and back. That is exactly how countries without um, airlines will benefit from SATA. So moving on to the component two, um, what are the, the benefits, um, the value of SATA in terms of interconnectivity and liberalization? This is the picture that says everything, but I'll just explain it all. It leads to lower fares, increased frequencies and enhanced connectivity, and, I'm, and I'll show you how. Um, leading to air traffic growth. You would have seen this already before from our 12 country study, but this is now expanded to our 55 country study. And it is evidenced in every single state for in Africa, in every country in Africa. It leads to air traffic growth, leading to increased tourism, increased trade, investment opportunity and productivity, leading of course to um, employment, economic growth, and social economic development. And we're gonna go into a little bit of that. So what are the traffic Im impacts? Remember we said it's going to lead to increased frequencies and traffic. Well, looking across all of the continents, we said, first of all, especially because of the impact of COVID, where all 55 countries in Africa um, to liberalize, say from 1st of January, uh, 2022, we're going to see an additional traffic growth expected over um, expected over two to three years of 51%, an additional number of 15.9 or 16 million passengers from the 30 something million that we saw already in the different reports in the, you know, the report from the SG of AFRA and some of the other statistics that we've seen. So there would be a 16 million addition. I mean, almost half of, of these numbers, 50, 50 something percent. This is quite significant in such a short period of time. And of course, once the liberalization has already occurred, the growth can only continue to be exponential. This shows you also the traffic growth by country. So you can see again, that the growth forecast for the countries that don't really have um, a well liberalized market or even um, airline services will be greater than those who are more mature. But nevertheless, every country in Africa stands to benefit from traffic increase. The second is in terms of air connectivity. Remember that map that I showed you before looking at the 20 year forecast? Well, this one shows us that, you know, we have the current picture in the red, which was the 20, 2019 picture of where, you know, there was intra-African uh, connectivity in terms of uh, routes. And this shows an additional 145 country pairs will receive, you know, services, direct service uh, uh, through uh, liberalization. That's the potential um, that can happen with full liberalization across the continent. And those um, existing routes today um, will see an increase of 27%. That's about 30% increase in terms of route frequencies, existing route frequencies. 
Now, these are, this is the projection, and we, this is the hope that we're able to achieve this potential. Of course, there are different uh, parameters, different countries have different um, situations, uh, and every market is unique, um, but we're hoping uh, that this is what can be achieved. And in terms of what that means, the number of the fair savings and, and the, the passenger impact that this can bring are also quite significant. One is that the indication that intra-African fares will reduce by 26% overall, uh, and that's a significant uh, number uh, in terms of 1.46 billion per annum based on 2019 traffic levels. That's a significant saving. And put the other way, that is a significantly increased pool of people who can travel because they have more income in their pocket as a result of these fair savings. The other is the consumer surplus, which is a measure of the economic welfare, uh, reflecting greater access, you know, how many more people can access the air travel market because they can afford to. And that is, again, estimated to increase by up to 2.85 billion, another significant number here, and really a benefit for the African consumer. Today, we have less than 10% of the African population traveling by air. And with increased liberalization, there'll be deeper access uh, across the continent. Now, looking at the combined benefits, um, the, the, the total economic benefit is an additional 589,000, let's say 590,000 new jobs uh, and 3.96 billion contribution in GDP. Um, in terms of the jobs, 16% comes directly from aviation, 45% from tourism, and 38% from the other, you know, affiliated things that we heard about tourism and leisure and, and all of the, 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 the jobs that are generated as a result of airline operations and the aviation industry in general. In addition to that, an additional 1.84 billion of intra-African trade can be carried by air. And we heard and saw all of what happened during the COVID in terms of the great opportunity and innovations in cargo. Imagine that Africa, intra-African cargo increases in such a way that 1.1 billion, will, sorry, 1.1% 1 .1 will be contributed to the intra-African trade from what it was in 2019, which was about 18%, to in two to three years, an increase of up to about 20%. And I know that the projection for the, inter, uh, the African continental free trade area is to see inter-African trade increase up to 30% by 2030. Um, so th this is something, this will already contribute significantly towards those numbers. And again, the final message in this slide is that the GDP impacts tend to be largest in smaller and less developed countries and smallest in larger economies because they already you know, have airline, uh, um, a, a more mature aviation markets and so on. But nevertheless, every single country in Africa will benefit from increased liberalization. And we can see the spectrum on this graph. So that is the economic benefit. But we also extended the study to really capture the social benefits. We could have imagined what they were, but we actually did research um, and we did a mapping of aviation to the UN Sustainable Development Goals, looking at SATAM, which is the liberalization of air services, but also the um, AFCFTA and the free movement protocol. And we, we discovered that aviation actually has an impact on almost all the 15 out of the 17 UN SDG in tangible ways. So contributing to no poverty, zero hunger, decent work and economic growth, the SATAM can bring all of these about through you know, higher employment rates, national income growth, access to education, jobs um, and highly skilled jobs in, in, in aviation, which is a high, requires high skills in, in many areas and technical skills and STEM, um, health and well-being, uh, increasing connectivity, um, access to medical services, 
committing to efficiencies, focusing on sustainability. We heard Willie Walsh talk about that, and it's a key focus for Africa and for African aviation and for the industry as well. Um, unity, the culture and connectivity of the continent, and also gender equality and gender, gender balance. So there is a lot here that can be unpacked. And again, this is important and is, is made relevant for each country. So the key recommendations from the study are basically this. One, the objective really of the study was, let us look at all of the African states and give um, the material uh, based on factual analysis on, or for each country to be able to see what would be the value um, of SATAM and what benefits do they stand to gain from implementation of the SATAM. So the objectives are one, to encourage the existing SATAM members to fully implement the SATAM, and the two, to encourage the outstanding non-SATAM states to sign onto the SATAM and to fully implement it based on you know, the points B and B to F below. Um, in order to achieve these specific objectives, it's important for states and their airlines to follow these, you know, these recommendations. For the non-SATAM states, go ahead and join, sign the solemn commitment, and then start working on the implementation steps in B and F below. For SATAM states and those who come on board, amend all the bastards in African states to ensure full compliance with the YD or just adopt a multilateral approach and adopt and abolish BASA, um, the BASA approach once and for all. Two, ensuring that whatever these agreements are, they are in compliance with articles two, three, four, and five, five and six of the YD, which speaks to the issue of market access, um, traffic rights, freedom of traffic rights, um, capacity, affairs, and pricing and other um, technical elements. These are what are important to ensuring airline operations between states. Then granting fifth freedom rights, but even as a minimum, third and fourth freedom rights, which we discovered you know, that there's still restrictions on across many African states. And recognition of all designated African eligible airlines to be able to operate, adherence to the ICAO, um, EI and, and other best practices on safety. So the eligibility criteria for safety is the EI score and the airlines one is, is the IOSA or the ESA for airlines that are below 5.7 tons. Fully implementing the SATAM concrete measures of AFCAC, uh, focusing on adherence to the SATAM enablers. Again, reminding us that these are the full enablers looking at the whole picture of a country. You know, what is your whole aviation a picture look like. And these are the things that can help drive a holistic aviation sector and drive the implementation of SATAM. And fostering airline cooperation and coordination to increase inter-African connectivity through route development, increasing frequencies and fifth freedom operations. So we're gonna pause here now after having said all that and see if we have any questions and also take another poll. Rafaela, over to you. Thank you, Funke. Let me uh, launch the, the next poll while we are viewing if we have more questions. So the poll is uh, live now. Um, so, the, so the poll is asking the question here that, you know, what is the, what would you say is the single driver for SATAM implementation? And there are a few options there. So Rafael, I don't know if you want to just take, take us through yes. this. Yes, no Thanks. problem. The, the options are, the first one is the political will. The second option is uh, signing multilateral agreements. The third option, regulatory instruments on competition and dispute resolution. The fourth option is airline cooperation. So um, the attendance, the poll is uh, on now can listen your, your answers. What is the single most important SATAM implementation mm -hmm. driver? Thank you, thank you. And again, this would be quite an interesting one uh, to get the answer or maybe a combination of answers because it will help in us in our work, not just advocating on the benefits of the SATAM, but also working 
on the implementation of the SATAM. Thanks, Funke. We are still receiving uh, answers. Let's give our participants some few minutes. Um, okay. In the meantime, um, somebody has sent a message saying that the, our session seems to have ended. Is that correct? The session is still live. The session is okay. still live. Thank you. I think we'll we're going to close the poll now. Okay. And so actually, uh, fifty-five percent of uh, the respondents said that political will is the most important SATAM implementation driver. Uh, Eighteen percent said that signing multiple agreements is uh, the most important driver. 18% also say that regulatory instruments on competition and dispute uh, resolution is uh, the driver. And 9% say that airline cooperation is the most important certain implementation driver. Excellent. Thank you very much to, to everyone who participated. And, and I must agree with you that based on the analysis, based on the work we did in the study, it really does appear that you know, the political will, which in this case doesn't just mean, or oh, people being aware of the importance of SATAM and, and going forward with it, but actually active, actualizing and implementing SATAM is the most critical factor. And I can't agree with you more. And because of that, you know, we also decided that we would have a third component, a third element of the SATAM, which is to ensure that every single country has its own information about the value of aviation and the benefits of implementing the SATAM. And so we did exactly that for each country in Africa to, to be able to um, support this uh, advocacy uh, of changing the mindset, uh, the paradigm, and to secure the pro political will for implementing the, the SATAM. So, we took some examples and for every country, but we're just showing a few examples of some of the countries on our list. Remember that when we did our BASA analysis, Cabo Verde came out as a high, um, as a high uh, SATAM compliant, YD compliant state. Again, remember the compliance we're talking about here is the actual provisions of their bilateral air service agreements with other states and how compliant those provisions are with the core articles of the YD articles two, three, four, five, and six. And so Cabo Verde is, is classified as, as the top and shows that with um, implementation or liberalization uh, of SATAM, it stands to increase uh, its traffic um, to 44% in terms of, which is about 40,000, um, uh, uh, additional passengers, um, $1.6 million in fare savings, $2.7 million in consumer surplus. And you can see the wider economic benefits there in terms of employment, increase in tourism visits, increase in employment, um, tourism spend, tourism employment, and so on. And this is, is significant. So now, you know, the Minister of Transport in Cabo Verde, I was on, uh, we were on another session yesterday, and he was able to speak to these things for his country. It's the first time that he's ever had this information about his country. And he's saying, well, of course, now I'm going to go to my parliament or I'm going to go to my president and we're going to show the value of aviation. And not just for that, not just this information, but it also shows what each country needs to do to liberalize its market. And so ensuring that all of its bastards comply fully with the provisions of the YD, supporting airlines to attain IOSA registration, and improving its airport infrastructure are some of the key measures available to Cabo Verde to further increase connectivity. We go now to Senegal. We heard already from the CEO of, um, of Air Senegal in the last panel, some very interesting perspectives there. And, and also he's looking at, you know, 
the number of destinations are being flown at the moment, um, 21, many of which are in Africa. And it shows that, you know, increasing liberalizing across Africa from Senegal being classified as a medium uh, country in terms of its YD provisions in its parcels uh, will, will help increase uh, the inter-African uh, uh, passenger numbers uh, by an additional 50%. But it's not just on passengers, cargo as well will, will increase. And again, this is part of what we did in the study, wider economic benefits of the Saturn, tourism, um, spin-off industry, uh, 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 employment, and so on. And for Senegal, a further relaxation of its passes will offer access to new markets, uh, including those that would otherwise be deemed uneconomical. So these are some of the things that for each country, there is a clear recommendation that the countries can take. Um, for, for Nigeria, a 54% increase with liberalization. We have the numbers on the side there. Um, further, further relaxation of, of buses can offer new access. And, and yet Nigeria currently is classified as, as medium. Same with Ethiopia, a 42% increase and all of these other things, but still a further 49, uh, a further relaxation of buses will see uh, you know, uh, bigger increases in, in numbers. Um, South Africa, uh, medium as well, same thing. Um, and uh, it's quite interesting that it can do a lot more because it's quite a large market already, but a further relaxation of its passes will help lead to a bigger increase. Kenya, interestingly classified as, as a low um, YD compliant country, and that is speaking to the provisions of its passes. Um, but if it were to relax those buzzers and bring them into better compliance with the YD provision, it will see a 46% increase in, in the numbers. So these are all some of the interesting insights that this shows um, for each country. Beyond that, um, there's also a need for communication. I think um, one of the CEOs in the last panel mentioned it, that we don't communicate enough what we do in the industry, but also um, what aviation um, can do for the others, not just about what we can do for ourselves, but what can we do for our country? What can we do for our economies? What can we do for the continent and the world around us? And so there is a communication plan that will follow the formal launch of this study. It hasn't been launched formally yet because it's still being translated into the uh, AU languages to ensure that all countries have it in, in all formats and, and they can digest and read them in French, in Portuguese, in Spanish, in Arabic, uh, and so on. So that's still going on. I, and I believe the AU anticipates that that will finish uh, hopefully late January, latest early Feb. But be, before that, we've already started to share this um, information. And again, I'd like to point you in the right direction um, that there is a website, a dedicated website, which I'll take, you, um, I'll take you to next, but that we've already started the communications plan um, with engaging within the industry at events like this. We had an event yesterday, we had one last month, we're having another one on, on Thursday with the Aeropolitical Forum, the African Aviation Industry Group Aeropolitical Forum, AIG, that happens typically on the back of the AFRA AGM. So we'll be presenting again. So we are now taking the opportunity to start the sensitization within the aviation community, but not just to the players, to the, to the, to the states, the decision makers. At yesterday's event, we had ministers of transport and aviation. We had um, high level officials from the um, African Union um, and, and so many other players who were present. So we've started that sensitization and we're going to continue it. We're going to use the dedicated platform or website. We're also going to use social media to ensure that the message gets heard and seen. Um, finally, there is a dedicated uh, website, as I mentioned. It is www.satambenefits.org. Rafaela, if you don't mind, please drop in it into the chat box so that people can click on it. And just to navigate how it works very quickly, when you get to the site, you get onto the landing page and it shows you a dashboard where you can go and check, you click on each country and it will show you all of the information on the country. But you can also go to a drop-down 
uh, dashboard and click on different parameters and it will show you information about each country in Africa um, using that particular parameter. It also has um, different, like I said, different um, drop downs. It gives information about the SATAM, the mission, the vision. It gives information about um, the publications of the SATAM. So the continental study itself is quite a large study. I think, you know, almost 200 pages, but it's been distilled into, you know, summaries. There's an, an, an executive summary. There's an information paper on the study for high level officials, presidents, ministers, heads of state, and so on, and other policy makers. Um, and then there's the country, individual country fact sheets that I mentioned to you for each country. There's an executive summary and there's a fact sheet. And there's also past publications on the SATAM. So it's www.satambenefits.org. And the objective is to enhance visibility about the SATAM, is really to talk about it. Why is it important? Why is liberalization important for Africa? Why is liberalization important for my country? And why is liberalization important for my airline? And without further ado, we also have some videos that we developed as a part of this um, study and a part of the campaign that can also be used to share uh, and sensitize different stakeholders. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and Rafaela, over to you to kindly play the video. Once again, the website is www.satambenefits.org. Thank you. Thank you very much, Funke. Uh, the website has been uh, shared on the, on the chat and I'm sure participants are going to, to, to visit it. So let's go now to the to the video. Dreams. We all have them. And they're each as unique as we are. Some of us aspire to take on new challenges to expand our horizons and to create something entirely our own. Others want to study, to grow, and to achieve things we never imagined possible. There are those of us who long for adventure, to marvel at cultures unlike anything we've ever seen before. And then there are those of us who want to stay closer to home, to build a family, or to provide for the one we already have. No matter what we strive to do, to see or to become, we need the right opportunities and the right environment for our dreams to take flight. We need a more connected and integrated Africa. The Saturn was launched to liberalize the African air transport market. By joining and taking action, nations are becoming more integrated with each other, one step at a time. And by increasing our unity across state, we're strengthening our economies, bringing countless benefits to ourselves and to each other. We're finding new synergies, allowing for a freer flow of people, goods, and services. And we are supporting jobs for all, especially our youth. With an increased commitment to implement the SATAM, New routes will open up across the continent while making it safer and more affordable to travel by air. Giving us greater freedom to go where we want to go. So no matter who we are, our dreams can truly take flight. With the center, we can lift each other up and take Africa to new heights. Let's dream to be change makers. Together, creating the united and prosperous Africa we all want. Thank you very much. So uh, a lot of information on the website. There's a lot of material that people can read up on and, and find out information and also um, the the information the, the animation you saw on the website is a compilation of all of the flags of Africa that were put together to show the colors and the different uh, images. So um, happy to take any questions. Thank you, Rafaela, and thank you all for your time and attention.
Thank you very much, Funke, for this uh, really insightful presentation. We have uh, some comments from, uh, from the floor, congratulating you for this well done presentation and for the great uh, job doing, uh, done by Ayata. Uh, I, have, uh, I will take just two questions. Um, uh, there are uh, African countries we are not signatories of the YD, but are member of the SATA. Okay, thank you, Francis. Quite an interesting question, that one. I believe that there are 44 signatories to the YD, um, and there are 35 signatories to the SATA. So just be because of that gap, there will be some countries that are not signatories to the SATAM, but are signatories to the YD. And I believe also that the converse may be the case, that there are probably some countries that are signatories to the SATAM, but are not signatories to the YD. But we haven't actually done that analysis. So maybe we can just spend a little bit of time tinkering around and finding out you know, which small pool of countries that, that would be. Great, thank you, Funke. Another question from Victoria. Which of these findings surprised you most? And uh, can you confirm if this is the first time that the results of the study have been presented? Okay, uh, thank you, Victoria. So I was most surprised by the fact that third and fourth freedom rights are even still being quite restricted across Africa. That was the biggest surprise. It was also surprising that the number, the percentage of intra-African, uh, of fifth freedom um, root operation in Africa was as low as it was. I thought that it was, you know, significant, well, maybe not significantly, but a bit higher, say around 30%, but it's that 15% in 2019, and 2019 was a very robust year for intra-African, for, for, for travel generally and for intra-African travel. So those those three those two points were quite were quite surprising. The other surprising thing was looking at the number of bassas, and this was a lot of work. <laughs> we had people who were dedicated to really looking at each and every provision in the 607 bilateral air service agreements across all the African countries, and um, it was interesting that. 61%, so it's like a 60-40 split, that you know, about 60% are not compliant, are not fully compliant with the YD. But again, if you think about the results that we saw, which is you know, how, how liberalized is the market in terms of fifth freedom rights, and also what is the percentage of people who are moving around, I think it stands to reason that that number is correct. So it bears, it bears things out. So these were some quite startling um, revelations. The other thing that was quite positively um, interesting was just the sheer significance in the benefits of liberalization for Africa. And in the short time, time forecast, within two to three years, these numbers can be realized within two to three years. So imagine what can happen as time goes on. We would see what is happening in Europe over time. We would see what is happening in, you know, in, in North America, in, in, in Asia, and so on. So it, this is no longer, you know, the, the idea or, of, or theory of liberalization is no longer anecdotal or just a theory or, academ or, or an academic exercise. It needs to be tested so that we can reap the benefits. Without the testing, we cannot reap the benefits. And the final thing, um, that we found, and I think that goes to the, the, the question, the last question we asked the poll, which was, you know, what is the single biggest driver? Well, we also found through the literature review, through surveys, you know, we actually asked questions to live <laughs> people in, you know, countries, in, working in aviation, in ministries of transport, in, in aviation, in civil aviation authorities, and airlines. And what are the challenges? What's the issues to liberal and, and the two overarching themes were that aviation is simply not given the priority by governments, many governments across Africa, that it deserves because of the role it can play as a strategic economic developer and enabler of growth. And also protectionism. So these are some of these 
interesting revelations that we found. And, and the final point, Victoria, is no, this is not the first time the study has been presented. We presented it um, first at the validation workshop for the African Union. And so some of the key stakeholders have seen this, ICAO, um, AFRA, some of the people from the African continental free trade area, um, and then other players, uh, um, ACI, uh, um, ASA, some of the, the, the core industry. And then we had a, a capacity building workshop with AFRA uh, in October, and that was presented. So I think that was the first time it was presented to a wider audience, uh, particularly with that aviation, with the airline uh, group. And since then, we've presented it at other, you know, aviation, African aviation conferences. And as I mentioned, just yesterday, we had the 22nd uh, anniversary of the Yamasukuro decision. And uh, at that event, I presented uh, a, a wider, more ex expanded version of this presentation because of the high level attendance uh, of the ministers and, and representatives of presidents at that meeting, who, you know, for the first time would be hearing that, you know, aviation can benefit their country and, and how so. And yes, Heidi, Heidi, you can get a copy. Afra will be sharing the presentation afterwards. Thank you. Yes, great, great. Thank you very much, Funke. Uh, we exceeded our time from far, but it was a really, really interesting <laughs> session and uh, insightful. So uh, we're going to, to close now our session. Uh, thank you very much, Funke for your participation. And uh, thank you very much to all our attendants. We hope to have you tomorrow uh, uh, from uh, 1, 1 a.m. Uh, East African time. That will be uh, 10 a.m. GMT. And uh, we'll continue our presentation and uh, discussions on the uh, future of the aviation industry. Thank you very much to everybody and uh, have you tomorrow. Bye.